Good evening, and welcome to the Concord Bookshop. Until April 14th, 1865, the most famous members of the <coughs> Booth family were the actors, Junius Brutus Booth and his son, Edwin Booth. As a result of the rivalry between Edwin and his brother, John Wilkes, for their father's approval, and after his death to claim his legacy, it climaxed in the first assassination of, the Amer of an American president. We're pleased to have with us this evening Nora Titone, whose book, My Thoughts Be Bloody, the bitter rivalry between Edwin and John Wilkes Booth that led to an American tragedy, delves deeply into the complicated Booth family and how it changed the course of American history. Nora Titone studied American history and literature as an undergrad at Harvard University and earned an MA in history at the University of California. She worked as a historical researcher for a range of academics writers and artists, including our own Doris Kearns Goodwin, and she currently lives in <laughs> Chicago. My Thoughts Be Bloody is her first book, and please welcome Laura to town. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to speak briefly about how I started this project, and then I would love to have a conversation with you about this topic. As you know, I was working as a researcher for Doris Kearns Goodwin when the idea for this book came to me. There was a diary written by a young woman named Fanny Seward. She was the daughter of William H. Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, a major character in Team of Rivals. Mm -hmm. And she lived with her father in Washington through many of the war years, and she kept a faithful record of every guest who dined at the Seward Mansion. Hmm. She was a wonderful writer. And many people came to the Seward Mansion. President Lincoln, who Fanny believed was unimpressive. <laughs> he had a Westerner's accent. He said, I heard, instead of I heard. Um, not a gentleman. She wasn't impressed. General Grant was another guest who was bureaucratic and dry. But there was a guest who awed her, who inspired her, who made her devote 35 pages of this diary to her recorded impressions of how thrilling he was. And that was the actor, Edwin Booth. And when I read this entry, I was transfixed. Because first of all, what was an actor doing in the dining room of the Secretary of State in Washington, D.C. Actors, as you probably know, in the 19th century were social outcasts. They were pariahs, the lowest people on the totem pole. And that assignment of them to a place in society was largely due to the fact that what actors did on stage was looked at as a form of witchcraft combined with manual labor. They were using their bodies <coughs> to earn money nightly. So why was this actor in the house of the Secretary of State? I pulled that thread a little bit and found that Edwin Booth, whose name I had never heard of before, had been summoned to Washington by the White House to give command performances for the President and First Lady on what was a momentous state occasion, the third anniversary of Lincoln's inauguration. Edwin Booth was a colossal celebrity. He was the 19th century equivalent of a millionaire during the Civil War. He owned his own theater on Broadway. It was called the Winter Garden. And from its stage, he performed stupendous stunts like playing Hamlet 100 times in a row, night after night after night after night. Uh, a feat that crowded headlines off the front page at the height of the war. So that was another reason he was invited to Washington. He was a uniquely patriotic actor. But most importantly, Edwin Booth had crossed that invisible line that separated actors from the mainstream of society. He had become a friend of Julia Ward Howe, the author of The Battle Hymn of the Republic. She had helped launch his career. 
and she introduced him into high society. So that helped bring him to the table with the Secretary of State. And the last thing he did, I think, that probably earned him a place there, was that he was so passionate and committed to the Union war effort and to Abraham Lincoln that he used his theater on Broadway as a fundraising engine for the Union war effort. He, would, he called himself Corporal Edwin Booth. He called his actors the Federal Dramatic Corps. And they put on charity productions of Shakespeare that raised thousands of dollars for the Union war effort. Little known facts about the older brother of John Wilkes Booth. So there he was in the house of the Secretary of State in March of 1864. And a year later, a little more than a year later, an accomplice of his brother breaks into the Booth home armed, stabs the Secretary of State, attempting to kill him, pushes Fanny, the author of this diary, to the ground and hurts her and almost fatally injures Seward's other son. A cautionary tale about inviting an actor to your dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and this story, this, this fact, tantalized me because I never knew that John Wilkes Booth had had an older brother. Mm -hmm. I never knew he was a colossal celebrity who loved President Lincoln, who was an ardent unionist, an abolitionist, friend of Julia Ward Howe. And that is what drew me to start investigating this story. Mm. And what I found <coughs> was that John Wilkes Booth's crime in Ford's theater had no effect on his brother's career, mm -hmm. his fame, or his social prestige. If anything, all of those factors multiplied in Edwin's favor after 1865. And by the end of his life, Edwin Booth was living in a remarkable club called The Players on the choicest piece of real estate in Manhattan, Gramercy Park. It was a club founded as a monument to the Booth name. Edwin created it as a gathering place for the most talented men, the geniuses, the brightest minds of his generation. And he founded it with the help and this astonished me, of US President Grover Cleveland, who was one of his closest friends, with the help of Mark Twain, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, and the financier J.P. Morgan. Every New Year's Eve, these towering figures would gather in the club and toast Edwin Booth's name with champagne and do honor to his legacy. Clearly, there was a story here. Um, two men who couldn't have been more different, who each left their mark on the 19th century. One, the Confederate assassin of Lincoln. The other, the most beloved celebrity of the Union. So how did one family produce two such different brothers? What was the relationship between these young men during the crucial years of the Civil War. And despite the fame of one and the infamy of the other, why had their relationship not been explored? There was a hidden history here, a lost drama that I dedicated myself to finding. And the place that you go to get this story is not the National Archives or the Library of Congress, which is where one typically goes to find out about the assassination. But you go to theater archives, because the Booths were a family of actors. And you can also go to the Players, this club I was describing, which still operates, it still stands in Gramercy Park. And that is where the bulk of the Booth family manuscripts are held. All the private papers, all the stories are there. And when I went there, it took a year of petitioning the curator who guards mm -hmm. these papers um, very fiercely. Um, I went to Edwin Booth's room, which is preserved, undisturbed, from the day of his death. And there is a sign over his desk that is taken from the tomb of Shakespeare at Stratford-on-Avon. And it reads, good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to disturb the dust enclosed here. 
Blessed be he that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Mm -hmm. It's a warning to the historian not to dig up the family skeletons, but <laughs> it gave me pause, but that's what I spent three years doing. And this book is the result of those excavations. And the story that I found was astonishing. The Booth theatrical dynasty had dominated the 19th century. They're forgotten now. But they were a family who made their meat and milk performing Shakespeare on stage. Mm. But they were themselves Shakespearean in their fractiousness and their ambitions and their jealousies. And their two leading men, Edwin and John Wilkes, are the starring characters of this book. And their rivalry fairly smolders from the pages of these family papers when you read them. The story is there to be found. And actually, it's astonishing to me that Edwin Booth didn't burn these papers before he died. <laughs> because it is a riveting story. And it's a story that spans the 19th century. It's not just those crucial years of the Civil War. It begins the wilderness years of the early Republic, the 1820s, and it stretches through <coughs> to the Gilded Age. It encompasses this amazing cast of characters, Julia Ward Howe being one of them. There are many others. And at the heart of it is this lost drama that sheds new light on that moment in Ford's theater that is such a defining moment in the history of our country. So I would love to talk with you this evening, have a conversation, um, and tell you about what I found and answer your questions, if you have any. Uh, did Edwin leave a lot of writings about his relationship with his brother? Is that what, uh, was This is very interesting. He never spoke John Wilkes's name in company of anyone other than the most intimate circle of his family at this club that he founded with all of these men. No one ever mentioned John Wilkes's name. You had to pretend the founder, Edwin Booth, never had a brother by that name. And Lincoln's name, in fact, was never mentioned under the roof of that club. But the papers are so revealing. Um, the moment after the assassination, Edwin is here in Boston. He's acting at the Boston Theater, the Boston Museum. And he writes that in that moment when he got the news, he was not at all surprised that his brother had killed the president. He said, my mind accepted the fact at once. I thought my brother was capable of just such a wild action. And then he wrote, oh, where has my glory gone? My ambitions have been blasted by a villain. He took the assassination quite personally, personally uh, narcissistically. What does this mean to me? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And at that moment, in fact, he said, I'm going to retire from the stage permanently in penance for my brother's crime. And he wrote a letter to the American people saying, I'm going to struggle into my retirement bearing a wounded name and a heavy heart to my too welcome grave. This pledge didn't last very long. <laughs> um, six months after Lincoln's body was placed in the tomb at Springfield, Edwin announced his return to the stage. <laughs> and he even, amazingly, um, mounted a production of Our American Cousin at his theater, the Winter Garden, um, in September of 1865. And this, of course, was the play that had entrapped Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And one of the stars of this play, remarkably and audaciously, was John Sleeper Clark, a little-known figure, who was the brother-in-law of Edwin Booth. And he was fresh from the old Capitol prison in Washington, where he had been held under suspicion of conspiring with John Wilkes to yeah. shoot Lincoln. But he was released. and. Then he starred in this production of Our American Cousin. Um, and <clears throat> what was truly amazing was that there was only one voice raised in protest <laughs> of that action. Laura Keene, the woman who, 
the actress and playwright and director who had starred in Our American Cousin, The Night of Lincoln's Murder, she had been Edwin Booth's mistress, a little known fact. And that intimacy gave her uh, an opening to write Edwin an angry letter saying, how dare you stage this play at your theater, this play that should only have a memory of shame and horror for you and your family. Um, but nobody else raised a voice of protest. She was the lone mm. opposition. When Edwin returned in Hamlet, um, less than a year after the assassination, cheering and weeping crowds greeted him. And his silence on his brother's crime, you know, only those few sentences where he takes it quite personally and believes it's a direct attack on his celebrity, on his fame, um, that's all we get. Um, but by his bed in this club, he kept a picture of his brother. It still hangs there, you can see it. Right by his pillow, he could see it morning and night. So clearly, John Wilkes was always on his mind. And sometimes the silences are where mm -hmm. people reveal where they feel the most, I think. Yeah. I'm wondering what, what, the, uh, what the root cause was of this rivalry between, between the, two, the two brothers. Well, it starts very early. Their father, Junius Brutus Booth, was this legendary Shakespearean actor, born in London. He is a colossal figure on the London stage. He's a friend of Lord Byron. His interpretations of Shakespeare are so extraordinary and novel and shocking um, that they spark riots in the city of Flinton when he performs. And he, he is the one who brings the family. He comes to the United States in 1821 to escape an adultery scandal. He's um, absconding with a woman he's fallen in love with, leaving his wife and child behind. He comes to the United States. And he's a genius in the true sense of the word. He speaks 10 ancient and modern languages. Um, he can sculpt marble. He writes poems and plays, and he also acts. So he's truly a polymath. And he and his mistress have 10 children here in the States, including Edwin and John Wilkes. They're all illegitimate. And they live in rural isolation, in hiding, really, because they don't want the scandal of this adulterous relationship to be known to the world. Junius wants his acting career to be untouched by any, um, you know, any kind of scandal. So the children really are ra born and raised in isolation. And Junius scans them for signs of talent, you know, the, the Booth genius, this mind. And Edwin has it. From day one, he's extremely verbal. He has a fantastic memory. He's strange looking and dark and kind of scrawny, and he's a physical coward. But he has his father's mentality, John Wilkes, who is the physical image of his father, um, the family called the dullard. <laughs> you can see it in the family papers. It's quite cruel. But he didn't have a good memory. He didn't have that spark or that linguistic ability that makes an actor. And so early on, the father decides one son is going to follow me into the profession, and that Edwin, and the other son, John Wilkes, is going to train in a boarding school to become something greater than an actor. Because of course, low status profession. They want John Wilkes to aspire to something like the status of a gentleman farmer or a lawyer. So that partition begins early on. The father takes young Edwin on the road with him, starting at age 12, touring nationally from Albany to New Orleans, Cincinnati to San Francisco, um, while John stays home in Maryland in boarding school. And that is an initial break, because John Wilkes, of course, he looks like his father. He's charismatic, he's bold, he's aggressive. Why can't he go on stage? He says, Edwin's life is a golden holiday, and I'm stuck in school. And Edwin's life wasn't a golden holiday. Junius Brutus Booth was a, an appalling, um, problematic figure, as many geniuses are. He drank heavily. Um, he had a hard time separating the boundary between self and character on stage. So for example, while playing Richard III, he would lose himself in 
the character of Richard and refused to die in the last scene. <laughs> <laughs> and he would keep battling on with his sword and knocking his co-stars to the ground and they would be amazed at what was happening and this actor would run screaming out in the theater with his armor <laughs> clanking. Um, and the audiences loved it. Uh, but but it could also be quite quite sad as well because if he did, you know, for example, when he played King Lear, he might burst into tears mid-performance and beg the audience, as he did here in Boston, um, to take me to the lunatic hospital. He'd become overwhelmed by the madness of the Lear. <laughs> mm. And Edwin, at 12, this, it was his job to be the guardian of this figure. He had to keep him out of saloons, he had to keep <laughs> him on stage, on time for every performance, and he had to send the money home that his father earned every night, or else the family would suffer. And so it was a grueling labor, unfit for a 12-year-old. Um, Edwin did it for seven years. And I think the other wedge that was driven between the brothers um, happens when Edwin quits this job, finally. You know, he's 19 years old, he's been doing it for so long. His relationship with his father has become tormented, and he feels quite oppressed. And they travel together, it's an, it's an amazing journey. They travel from um, New York to California, to San Francisco. Um, actors are in great demand during the California gold rush, and the Booth family decides that this is a great opportunity to make money mm. um, on the stages of San Francisco and Sacramento, where minor 49ers apparently throw gold nuggets on stage if they're pleased by an actor. So the Booths had been bankrupted. Um, for That's another story. But this is a perfect moment to go and earn some money. And so Edwin and his father make this perilous journey by steamboat down the Atlantic coast, across the Isthmus of Panama, hiking through the jungle. Um, and in fact, um, Ulysses S. Grant makes the same journey two weeks behind them, and he loses half, loses half his men to cholera on that journey, but Edwin and Junius somehow survive. Um, they get to San Francisco, and Edwin abandons his father. He says, you can make it home on your own. I'm going to stay here in San Francisco. I'm 19. It's my chance to be a star. Junius returns alone, and he doesn't survive the trip. Oh. Hard-drinking actor, is robbed of his gold um, while he's crossing the Isthmus of Panama, and he dies on a Mississippi River steamboat all alone. So the family in Maryland, including young John Wilkes and the other siblings, they're impoverished. There's no family wage earner. John Wilkes leaves boarding school because they can't pay the tuition. And that split also begins this dark division in the family um, that tends, to, that gathers momentum as the brothers um, mature. Because of course, John Wilkes, rooted in Maryland, becomes a Confederate. Edwin, coming of age, in touring with his father in the North and in the theaters of California, is a Union man. So their rivalry, which in childhood starts out in these tangled family relationships, as they get older, it becomes a political rivalry, a professional rivalry, and a competition for fame and social prestige. <laughs> Nora, you mentioned that it took you, what, a year to yes. gain access to the Edwin Booth papers of yeah. players at Gramercy Park, negotiating with a curator. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Were you the first historian to gain that kind of extensive access well, to those papers? A lot of people, a lot of theater historians go in to use those papers, and they're wonderfully gracious once they understand what what it is you're looking for. You know, the letters I wrote were, were very diplomatic and careful. I think Edwin Booth's legacy is an important one to the players. And once you get there, it's a remarkable place. It's his house. And there isn't a way of um, using the collection all at once. You see it piece by piece. And you see the first thing that they brought me to, to read was Edwin's correspondence with Adam Badeau, who was Ulysses S. Grant's personal secretary. They were best friends 
Badeau had been a drama critic before war broke out, and he helped launch Edwin's career in New York. And these letters, which stretch from 1857 all the way through to 1865, are an amazing record of two close friends who are both at the center of history. Adam Badeau, who travels with General Grant throughout the war, and Edwin Booth, who's acting for Lincoln, you know, at the height of the conflict. So there are treasures like that at the players to see. There are Junius's diaries, the father, um, the diaries of his travels all throughout the United States, and accounts of his friendships with Andrew Jackson and um, Daniel Webster, and even Sam Houston of Texas. So there are all sorts of wonderful things that you can see. But these have largely been looked at by theatrical historians and not by people who are telling the story in the Civil War. So it's a very unique um, resource to be able to tap. Given the history you were writing, were they a bit reluctant to share too much too soon? You know, I think there's a sense that it was time there, you know, the, there haven't been biographies of Edwin Booth in, in generations. And so once you get through into this unique closed world of the Players Club, <coughs> then all the stories come out. Okay. Yeah. Now, there were 10 Ill illegitimate yes. children. Uh, how, what was the relationship with the rest of the siblings? Uh, like, uh, is there anything on that? There is. There, Edwin and John Wilkes were the two most promising of the bunch. Um, there was an older brother, Junius Brutus Booth Jr., who also wanted to be an actor, and he became one. But like John Wilkes, he was a mediocre talent. You know, he didn't have that spark. And there couldn't be too many actors in the Booth family because the Booth name was a huge commodity. It was a great income generator because Junius Brutus Booth was a huge celebrity. He was kind of the gold standard, even though people knew he was an eccentric and he was kind of a madman. Um, he still delivered a dramatic experience that no one else could deliver. So when his sons decided to come on yeah. into the profession, Edwin, who was the most successful early out of the gate, divides the country between them. So Junius, the, the older brother, Junius Jr., takes California, which is far away. Edwin declares he's going to take the Northeast, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, which is where the big theaters are, the big audiences, and the gold back currency. John Wilkes, Edwin says, can have the South, where theaters are very small, very far apart, and currency doesn't is not worth as much. It's harder to make a living. So there's a division of the map um, mm. that Edward does between the siblings, the male siblings who want to act. The other siblings, um, there were a lot of girls, and they, um, one of them, Asia Booth, is the historian of the family. She's a wonderful writer, and she's the one who really writes about the relationship of the brothers. Oh, is there a lot of uh, Oh, yes, yeah, she is. And she wrote two parallel histories, one for publication, because of course, after the assassination, she, this young woman, raced into print a hagiographical biography of her father, Junius Brutus Booth, to try to defend the family name. And then she writes a similar biography of Edwin Booth, also to kind of boost the family fortunes in the wake of this tragedy. But she writes another history, not for publication, private, which is where the real stories are, the real skeletons. And you can find that in these theater archives, not intended for a wide audience. So she's kind of the chronicler of the Booth family drama. The, uh, the venue of the assassination, you know, Ford's Theater, um, is, is that, is that in, intentional in a way, and the, in, in the whole way the assassination played out? in the theater, in the middle of a show, with John Wilkes landing down in the middle of the stage floor. And I mean, was that, was that all part of this scheme? And, and like, that was the chosen venue? Would it, could it have been any other venue? Or would it have had to have been something like, similar to that? Julia Ward. The public Ward, display. The public display. Well, Julia Ward Howe, who was a, 
Edwin's champion and um, helped also to cement his career. She had also met John Wilkes Booth um, here in Boston when John Wilkes was here. Uh, they were introduced. She wrote in her diary after the day after the assassination that John Wilkes Booth chose to assassinate Lincoln in a theatrical manner. You know, he did this in theater and his action is going to indict, she said it's going to ruin the theatrical profession and the Booth family because it was so clearly what an actor would do, what the son of Junius Brutus Booth would do, a man who was used all his life to acting tragedies. Um, and people at the time saw it, who were sitting in the theater, who were witnessing it, they saw it as a performance. They were initially, it seemed like it was part of the play, if you read eyewitness accounts, because it was the leap from the balcony to the stage was a leap that John Wilkes used all the time in Macbeth. He would jump 15 feet when he was playing Macbeth from a rocky outcrop on stage down to where the witches were stirring their cauldron. And so it was one of his signature tricks. It was a patented move. And he, when he walked before the footlights saying, Sic <coughs> Semper Tyrannus, he did that very theatrically and he flashed his dagger and posed. So it was a villain's star turn. And yes, it was the crime of an actor. But it was also a political crime. He hated Lincoln. He was a passionate Confederate. And the sentiments that obsessed him, those political sentiments, had been, if you read um, the record of, of how the family remembers those final months before the assassination, John Wilkes has been fighting with Edwin over politics, at times physically, before the assassination. And in fact, you know, the most remarkable scene that to me kind of sets up what happens in April of 1865, remember I said Edwin Booth has a theater on Broadway, the Winter Garden. He's never let John Wilkes perform there because this is Edwin's fiefdom, this is how he earns his money. He's the star, he's the director. No other Booth will act there. But in November of 1864, he does invite John to that stage to perform in Shakespeare's assassination tragedy, Julius Caesar. John Wilkes plays Mark Antony, Edwin plays Brutus. And it, it, when John Wilkes hears the invitation, he says, is this some trick of my brother's which will show you what their relationship is like? Mm -hmm. He mistrusts the invitation, but he does it anyway. And their lack, of, their, their difference in training is so apparent to everyone who comes to this show. John Wilkes has never been trained. He didn't have that incomparable education of touring with their father. He has no natural gift. So he's abysmal in his part, whereas Edwin delivers this soaring performance of brilliance. So on one level, it advertises to all of New York who the real actor in the booth is. <laughs> it also takes in the equivalent of $130,000 in ticket sales in one night. It's a huge money maker. John Wilkes at this point is hurting for money. He's cash starved. Does Edwin give him any of the profits from the evening? No. Every penny goes to build that statue of William Shakespeare that now stands in Central Park. <laughs> and the other bizarre thing that happens this night, which could only be invented by a novelist, but the newspaper documents <clears throat> that it's true, Confederates attack New York City on the night of this performance of Julius Caesar. <clears throat> Rebel conspirators fan out across Manhattan with the 19th century equivalent of, of Molotov cocktails. They set them off in hotels. One of them is next door to the Winter Garden Theater. They're trying to spark a massive conflagration to burn the city down in retaliation for Union Army looting in Virginia. And firemen burst into the Winter Garden Theater to check for flames in the middle of the performance, interrupting Julius Caesar, 
the crowd jumps up and tries to run away, but everybody calms down and the play continues. It's an extraordinary moment. And New York's volunteer fire companies do avert the tragedy. They put out all the flames. The city doesn't burn. But the next morning, Edwin and John Wilkes are talking about this interruption. And John Wilkes says, of course Confederates have a right to hit civilian targets. Fair is fair. It's real. Edwin, the Union man, throws his brother out of the house mm -hmm. and says, you are a treasonous rebel. I never want mm -hmm. to see you again. Never come. And that's the last they see of each other. Uh, and it's these <coughs> moments, these scenes, that define the brothers' relationship mm -hmm. that are crucial to the life of Lincoln's assassin mm -hmm. that have been missing from how we understand the path that John Wilkes Booth took to Ford's Theater in April of 1865. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the journalists at the time, how did they miss all of this? I mean, if these people these were such public figures, uh, this rivalry between the brothers and among the brothers, and um, you know all of these dramas, how was it that the journalists missed these points? Well, the Booth family had been in the spotlight of the national press from the 1820s on. The, the father, Junius Brutus Booth, was. Um, such a celebrity that he was constantly followed by, you know, you, you can find newspaper reports of him and then of the adultery scandal that ultimately um, bursts about the family um, and, and all the children are revealed to be illegitimate. That all made it into the press. But Edwin was a hero of all drama critics in the 1850s and 60s. You know, he was lionized. He was the great American artist um, because, of course, this country looked to Europe for its high culture, and so when we finally got an Edwin Booth who was changing the way Shakespeare was performed and who was um, elevating the theater to a high art, they wrote um, in praise of him and didn't focus on these inner conflicts because John Wilkes was really a minor figure. He's huge now, but at the time, he was the, the untalented, hapless member of the family, and he was largely ignored. What they did note was the difference in talent on stage. So you see in, in drama critics writing about, oh, well, Mark Antony wasn't very good in Julius Caesar last night, and you know his brother outshone him. So that was noted, but that inner conflict that Booth family kept quite private quite private. But I think it had to do with the fact that Edwin's friends during the Civil War were, many of them, in the New York press. You know, he was very close with the editor of the New York Tribune. Um, and Adam Badeau had worked for the New York Times. And so Edwin was a privileged, he was a privileged figure in that world. So there were very few scandal stories about him and his negative relationship with his brother. Um, was John Wilkes involved in more than um, one assassination conspiracy against the president? This is the only one. This, yeah. oh, it is. Okay. I, I, it started out, I think the plan was to kidnap, but then he. Yeah, there was. Yes. Yeah, right. right. That, yeah, then right. they said that's an impossibility, right? Yeah, okay. I thought. You mentioned that uh, <clears throat> Edwin uh, gave over uh, the South. Yes. John, did he actually uh, do any acting in the South? Or? Oh, it was the most unfortunate um, assignment anyone could ever imagine. Uh -huh. He, his, it, John Wilkes had been um, a supernumerary, which is the 19th century term for an extra, oh, yeah. um, for years. Mm -hmm. That's what, while his brother was a star, yeah. making the equivalent of you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. John Wilkes was toiling in this very lowly role as a supernumerary in Richmond, Virginia at the Richmond Theater. And he finally made his bid to become a star in 1860, the year Lincoln was elected. And his first tour is, very unfortunately, to Montgomery, Alabama, <laughs> where the 
then looking to be the capital of the soon-to-be Confederacy. Um, he gets there in the fall of 1860, and he's with this kind of ne'er-do-well manager who shoots John Wilkes in the rear um, with a pistol by accident while they're drinking in their hotel before the production of Hamlet is supposed to go on that <laughs> It's a disaster. So John Wilkes's first debut, you know, as a star in the South, he can't go on. You, uh, they couldn't get the, the bullet out of him. And so he's um, kind of sidelined in Montgomery, Alabama, while uh, secessionist militia groups are assembling in the streets while the election of 1860 is, is being discussed in full force in the town square. And even Stephen Douglas, the um, Democratic candidate, um, comes through Montgomery while John Wilkes is there, sidelined by a bullet wound, um, unable to perform at the local theater. And he listens to the political speeches. And it's a very strange moment. So his first tour as a star in the South is a very inauspicious one. He doesn't really get to act. Um, and and it's, it's very sad to read um, the record because, and surprising, because while all of this secession talk is going on, and it just shows you how complicated a figure John Wilkes is, he has to flee Montgomery, Alabama in the dark of night, flee for his life, because he defends the Union against local secessionists. He, he's in a bar and he says, well, why are you so hasty to secede? You know, Stephen Douglas has a point. Maybe, maybe you know, the Union is worth preserving. Yes, abolitionists are terrible, I agree, but maybe we can work this out. And John Wilkes Booth says those words in Montgomery, Alabama. And it's a very interesting moment. It's, a, it's in 1860, and you can see it. Um, he was the son of Junius Brutus Booth, a guy who opposed slavery, the father, who loved the Union. And there was a little bit of that tradition coming through when John Wilkes was in Montgomery. Um, he changes his tune by April 1861. And you see him wanting to join up with the Confederacy, but he doesn't do it because the South is suddenly closed to touring actors, right? Fighting, um, once fighting breaks out after Fort Sumter, actors can't tour freely in the South. So this is John Wilkes's chance to do what he's never been allowed to do by his older brother, act on the stages of Boston, of New York, of Philadelphia as a star. And that, you know, it's, it's answering those kinds of questions. Why didn't John Wilkes join the Confederate Army in April 1861 if he was such a passionate Confederate? That is an insight you can glean if you look at this family as a theatrical clan you know, the life of John Wilkes in the context of his brother, those kinds of questions get answered. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one question yes. about the, uh, your, your quotation from Hamlet, how all occasions to perform against me. What is the reason, what's the, what, why is the place there? What is the reason behind that? Well, the title, this, this is the quote that Hamlet says when he finally resolves what to do. You know, he's been undecided and dithering throughout the play, and he finally says, um, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or nothing worth. This is when he picks up the sword and decides to take action. And it, to me, it captured that moment for John Wilkes when he, you know, he spent much of the Civil War struggling to be an actor and failing. You know, in that crucial year of 1864, when Edwin Booth is performing for President Lincoln and the First Lady in Washington, D.C., and that performance is really a coronation of him as the reigning star of the Civil War years and of Shakespeare as a high art, suitable for a state occasion that the Lincolns would attend. When Edwin is doing that, and dining with the Secretary of State. John Wilkes is in Kansas, on the plains of Kansas, acting for farmers in the Leavenworth Town Hall. 
He's broke. <laughs> he can't get out of that region. He's snowbound. He's stuck. <laughs> he's got no money. And it's such a dramatic contrast between the fate of these two men. And what what's interesting to me, though, is that at that juncture, that's in the winter of 1864, John Wilkes isn't thinking about conspiracy. He's thinking about money. After Kansas, he does the, the most unexpected thing you can imagine. He goes to western Pennsylvania, a region called Petrolia, or Oil Dorado. Uh, crude had been discovered there at the start of the war, and there was, it was like a gold rush. It was like a mini gold rush. Thousands of people were going to western Pennsylvania to drill for oil. And John Wilkes says, I'm quitting acting. I'm taking whatever I've earned, and it wasn't much, and sinking it into this oil scheme, the get-rich-quick scheme, and it fails. He mm. drills three wells, he, <coughs> he loses his entire investment, they are all dry. Mm. And it is after that moment, in June, late June, early July of 1864, that he's recruited by the Confederate Secret Service. But you see him striving for fame on stage, striving for social prestige, striving for wealth, and then making that choice. So that quote that seemed be. to fit that moment. He, he had nothing left. He, he was out of options. He was out of he options. Was, he was an easy mock. That's right. That, by the way, that's the profile of yeah. a lone assassin. That's yeah. developed by the Secret Service. Really? Yeah. Does it really? Yeah. You know, so, social misfit. Someone who's, right. who's struggling. Right. Uh, someone who has, you know, a lot of personal issues and really desires to become um, an infamous figure. And I, what, mm. I, what I think is so challenging um, when you're looking back on these lives and these sources is to talk about mental states with people who had no vocabulary of psychology. You know, mm -hmm. clearly the Booth family was afflicted by troubled emotional lives, and they knew that they were, but the vocabulary that they used to talk about what they were feeling is very different from what we use today. They talk about nerves and nervous systems and feeling hysteria, but it's it's a different kind of language. Um, but clearly, they felt that they had problems. Mm -hmm. Marcia, you, you mentioned that uh, Edwin had his brother's pictures not far from his, I mean, he think about his brother quite often. Why don't he help him at all? That's a very interesting question. And and I will, as a parallel, people who, you know, when John Wilkes is in Petrolia with his oil wells and his shack, people who visited that shack in Petrolia said that he had pictures of his famous family on the wall. So John Wilkes probably had his picture of Edwin in that shack in Petrolia. Um, but why, why didn't Edwin Booth extend a helping hand to his younger brother? He could have, right? He could have been a mentor. He could have taught John Wilkes how to act, or at least encouraged him. He could have um, loaned him money, or helped him, you know, to earn money on stage at the Winter Garden. But there was a a 19th century attitude. I think there are three reasons that you had to make your own. Right? Edwin felt he had suffered. He had suffered being an indentured servant to their father for seven years. That was an interminable experience. While John Wilkes was in boarding school, <laughs> wearing uniforms and eating regularly and free from dancing attendance to a heavy drinking mad genius who was traveling around the country. And Edwin also struggled so um, passionately in his the early years of his career in California. Um, after their father died, he played every part that there was. He 
you know, was a clog dancer. He acted in comedies. He, you know, he, he wasn't a high artist. He was kind of a vulgar comedian and entertainer, and he played every part you could imagine in the theater. So he really earned his fame by tremendous hard work and suffering, and both with his father and then later on his own. And I think he looked at John Wilkes and said, I've given you half the country, the South, to work in. You know, it's not a desert. New Orleans, you know, there are Savannah, there are wonderful cities. You can go, you can, you can make something of this if you use your ingenuity and your energy. And what everyone says about John Wilkes Booth, if you read actors' memoirs of John Wilkes Booth, and not many, you know, these are amazing sources, he didn't want to work hard. He <laughs> looked just like his father. He had his father's face, the Booth face. Edwin didn't have the Booth face. Edwin was, you know, kind of peculiar looking, but John Wilkes was remarkably handsome. He had a great physique, and he felt entitled to parts. So when he's working as an extra, he doesn't work very hard. Theater directors who have him as you know a junior member of the company, they're not impressed. And he makes problems and embarrassments on stage, and he doesn't memorize his lines. He's disrespectful to the stars of the company. So he had the wrong attitude. You know, he wasn't a hardworking, dedicated. I'm going to you know do whatever it takes to be a star. He wanted it to come quickly and easily, and. I think that was part of the problem. And of course, they despised each other. And you can read their their personal antagonism starts so early. You know, when they're children, it's that envy between them. You know, Edwin's the chosen one of the father, John Wilkes stays home with the mother. They they play tricks on each other, they sabotage each other. Um, there really isn't any friendship there. And once war does break out, the political difference between them poisons the relationship entirely. Edwin can't even talk with John Wilkes because their politics are so opposite. Mm. Um, so like so many Civil War families, the Booths were split apart by that war. And the brother that Edwin does work with, the brother that Edwin does help financially and bring into the business, is a union man. Mm. So I think politics definitely plays into it. Wow. Still today. Still today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What happened to the remaining siblings and the mother after the assassination? Oh, it's it's such a compelling story. The mother, who had an eye on this brotherly relationship all along, and who was the one person in the family who championed John Wilkes's desire <coughs> to be an actor. She, interestingly enough, gave all the father's costumes. Remember, Junius Brutus Booth dies in, on the way back from California. Mm -hmm. His body makes it home, and his trunks of costumes make it home. And the mother gives these very valuable costumes to John Wilkes and says, take them and use them to become a star. They're your inheritance. So she has a stake in this story and in how it plays out. And the assassination devastates her, obviously. The wish of all the members of the family is that John Wilkes would be shot on the run. They wanted him killed. They did not want him tried and hanged because that would have been an unimaginable disgrace. But the family is already disgraced. The sister, Asia Booth, who I mentioned, she's six months pregnant with twins, they place her under house arrest, mm. under suspicion of conspiracy, because she was very close to John Wilkes. Mm. And that experience um, terrifies her. She moves to London soon after the assassination, once she's cleared of any guilt, and she never returns. She never sees the mother. She never crosses back the, uh, over the Atlantic again. She just wants to leave she says, all these unhappy scenes. So she disappears. June, the older brother, um, Junius Jr., he ends his years here in Massachusetts, the proprietor of the Seaside Hotel. He's never able to make it on the stage, um, so he becomes a hotelier. The mother um, is kept in lavish 
conditions by Edwin. She leads her life in comfort. Um, but in, you know, there, the whole family is, is cast in gloom by this. Except Edwin's career rockets after the assassination. People say Edwin Booth, already a celebrity, never made as many profits as he did after his brother assassinates Lincoln. He becomes this colossal figure, this friend of presidents. Um, Grover Cleveland, Mark Twain, J.P. Morgan, the Astors, the Vanderbilts, they're all clamoring to be hmm. in Edwin's circle. He becomes, How would you explain that after the well, family's he, been so disgraced? He's a national icon. He's a touchstone. Um, he becomes, people have this hunger to see him act because he represents, in a way, a connection, to, I think, to the martyred Lincoln, to that last scene of the Civil War. But he also is a Shakespearean actor, and the plays that he performs grapple with those themes of the Civil War, with, with the eruptions of war, of brother against brother, of father against son, these universal themes that speak to what the country went through during the Civil War years. So he really is this, he becomes a national treasure. And when he dies, he's mourned as the actor king, um, as the greatest artist of the 19th century. No other performer occupies the place that Edmund Booth does. And what's really heartrending, I think, is that um, one president, Chester A. Arthur, wants Edwin to come to Washington, D.C. to do a series of performances um, in the early 1880s, and Edwin refuses. Mm -hmm. Arthur, President Arthur, petitions again, this time getting the entire Supreme Court to sign a letter, getting <laughs> the cabinet, uh, members of the diplomatic court, you know, you lists and lists of, of signatures, and they send it to Edwin Booth, and he says, no, I will never go to D.C. to perform again. The closest I'll come is Baltimore. He goes to Baltimore, so President Arthur and the Supreme uh, Court commission <laughs> railroad cars. And night after night, these private, luxurious railroad cars take the entire you know, government of the country to Baltimore to see Edwin Booth. But th that just goes to show you how he overleaps the tragedy and the crime. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Uh,